Welcome to the Pause Awards Show, where we invite past winners and future judges to talk about their journeys, inspirations, and lessons learned in their professional careers and beyond. My name is George Hedden, and I'm a founder of Pause Fest and Pause Awards. Pause Awards are celebrating business achievements of impactful businesses that ultimately go to build better ecosystems. And today, I'm speaking with our awards judge. I'm talking to Carolyn Breeze, a leader in fintech and payment industries. Carolyn, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's very lovely to have you and thank you for joining Pause Awards 2021 with us this year. My pleasure. I'm really excited. Yeah, me too. Um, today, we're going to chat a little bit about you and what you've done. You seem to be uh, hopping a few different industries from e-commerce, telco to fintechs. Uh, what do you think they have in common? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I've been really fortunate in the last 20 years that I've worked in industries just as they've kind of taken off. So if I go back to my telco years, I was working for Telstra and Vodafone during the analog to digital change. And then um, at a point when we had a phone and a BlackBerry, and then, you know, when we launched 3G, then 4G and so on. And phones turning into smartphones and what that enabled from a customer experience and also an assisted life and enablement perspective. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then I moved into e-commerce, which was a huge change. Um, I moved to eBay because they were looking at becoming a place for new inventory as opposed to what they called, you know, a flea market for secondhand back then. What I loved about eBay is not only that I was there again for the wave of e-commerce and things um, kicking off in Australia, but eBay as a marketplace allowed mum and pop shops in their garage to compete on a global scale with someone like a Harvey Norman. And I really loved that about the marketplace. I love how it democratised that technology. When I then moved to PayPal and Braintree, equally um, Braintree as was the acquirer or the PSP that built the Uber payment experience and Airbnb and all these iconic frictionless experiences that we know today. And what I loved about that is the ability to then offer that same frictionless technology to e-commerce businesses of all shapes and sizes in Australia. Um, then looking at GoCardless and my move into bank or account to account payments, bank direct debit in Australia for small to medium business who are the people that need it the most. Uh, it's really hard to get access to. The banks traditionally wouldn't allow access or if they did, you'd have to put your house up against it as a guarantee or put a reserve in place. And then there was this heavy like onus operationally for a small business to manage the collection of money and keep details securely and push it through to the bank for processing and reconcile their accounts. And it's just too difficult. And the, a lot of these small businesses are not payment experts and we expect them to do so much. So GoCardless has democratised bank direct debit for small to medium businesses and enterprise organisations as well by making it accessible to all. Fantastic. You seem to have a specialty in... Um breaking into new markets and, and bringing new products to life. Yes. Is that something that you're ex very excited about and that's why you're taking some of these positions? Yeah, I've, I've been really fortunate to work for a lot of international organisations that are expanding into the Australia and New Zealand or, or APAC market. Um, you know, when you're, when you're exporting or you're, you're moving overseas into an emerging market from the US or the UK, you look at Australia as an easy entry market because of the language and we have a lot of similar kind of consumer behaviours and tech adoption. And uh, I've been really lucky to bring some of those to life in this market. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, and great story uh, and great experience you have. Uh, very diverse. I wanted to ask you something that you are very passionate about, and that's uh, diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, we know tech uh, has a long way to go, but I wanted to sort of see why is that important to you and how can tech be better at it? I think there's, uh, there's two aspects that are really important to me when it comes to diversity and inclusion. One is that I've worked in all sorts of organisations, obviously, and the ones that I feel have had the best culture and what is important to me about a culture is the ability to learn and grow, um, everybody being focused on the same outcome um, and treating the business like their own uh, and this knowledge sharing and kind of challenging each other in a really healthy way. 
And the organisations where I've seen that play out, the best are those that have a really diverse group of individuals, whether it be from their backgrounds um, or even skills, you know, aside from race and gender and all those things that we talk about, it's really important that your organisation as a tech company represents the community that you're going to be, you know, offering the tech to. Um, I've got a really good example of that actually with one of the companies that I worked for. We launched an app that allowed, um, it was targeted at people over 60 um, and it was about getting them to, you know, list items around the house um, to sell. That kind of gives away who it is. But anyway, um, but the team that were working on it, I think the oldest person in the team was like 28. <laughs> and so they've pulled together this great technology and they've pushed it out. And obviously adoption was really low. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think one is one thing is making sure that you have the diverse, inclusive environment internally to have the right talent uh, and to move forward and also very representative of the market that you're appealing to, which is, you know, if you're a tech company, you're assuming, you know, you're taking on the world, dominating. So that would be a very diverse group of individuals. The, the second part that's really important to me is the way in which um, tech organisations have an ability to change the way we look at inclusion and diversity. So unlike other more traditional verticals, tech is um, leading the way in many fronts, whether it be um, our investment into overseas, whether it be our, our, you know, trying to invest in local talent and educating talent, we have an opportunity in the tech industry, unlike any other vertical, to kind of break things and make them work for us. And one of the things I'm really passionate about is how we treat um, individuals in the workplace, particularly um, new parents or people dealing with different illnesses or accessibility issues. And when I say new parents, I kind of like to reiterate that because I, I have this belief that if we supported new fathers um, in a way that we sh should be supporting new mothers, then that support feeds home to that partner. I still feel like there's this unconscious conversation um, that, that, you know, that it's not happening at home and there's almost the assumption in the workplace and unfortunately in the home where the, the woman or the female, the mother bears the brunt um, or the majority of that caretaking. And I think that's something we've got an opportunity to change. Yeah, it's it's changing, but you're correct. Uh, uh, there's not enough talk and support in a, in a workplace about it. Yeah, exactly right. I remember when I had my second child, um, uh, I had, I think he was about two weeks old and obviously I was on maternity leave and um, there was a bunch of international executives from the organisation I was working for that were coming to Australia and, you know, we were lucky to meet them maybe once a year and it was really important to me that I got to meet them. Um, but I wasn't invited to that event because the assumption was I wouldn't want to go or I wouldn't be able to go. I had a male colleague at the same time who had also just become a new father he was expected to be at the event mm. and he was, you know, expected to be the last man standing and all with good intention, but he didn't even want to be at the event. Yeah, I wanted to be at the event. So, yeah, it's just interesting. It's not, it's not deliberate, but it's something that we really need to work on. Yeah, biases a bit. Um, flowing into, into another question I have about um, what do you love about technology and what ends up being a I call it a sort of a pain um, mm -hmm. over time potentially and that friction uh, in technology and I know also just to add to this um, I've read that you like to have options uh, as well so maybe that's something that you potentially like in technology if it you know offers an options more options or I mean you tell us what what is it that you love and what is it that you classify as potential pain in technology? Yeah, so the thing that I love um, about technology and and technology companies and these are the ones I always try to work with and work for is companies that are driving inclusion through building technology that provides choice. So going back to democratizing something, if a technology is being built that provides inclusion and accessibility. 
and choice to people that normally wouldn't have access to that type of technology or that kind of levels the playing field. That's something that I'm really passionate about and very interested in. Um, I'm really interested in then how that evolves um, into more assisted life. So when we think about how we shop, how we consume, how we manage a household, how we learn, um, how we stay healthy, what can technology bring to our lives to automate as much of that as possible um, so that they're the things that are like. When it comes to pain, um, that's a really interesting question. I think one of the things that I get frustrated in in the technology industry, and it's not really the industry, it's more how we support the industry, is the lack of education in the school system and particularly for younger children. Um, I, I've got two children, a 13-year-old and an eight-year-old, and technology is not in any way any part of anything that they are studying at school. We make a conscious effort in our house to expose them to as much of that as possible. Um, but it's still disappointing that nowhere in the curriculum for early childhood um, or those teenage years has that become part of what can be studied. And I, I find that just mind blowing when you look at the economy today um, and what the government's saying about where our future economy lies. And yeah, I just find it crazy that that hasn't been looked at. That is totally crazy. Um, I don't have kids personally, but I know kids spend a lot of time uh, online playing games and mm. engaging with the with the iPads and and uh, tech devices. But it's sad, really sad, to not see. Yeah, see that like in, in a. Yeah. It's like, is the best education we can give them Minecraft? Yeah. Like, that's a joke. Like, I love that my son's great at Minecraft, but if he's good at Minecraft at seven, imagine what he could do if we actually put the right tools in his hand. So, yeah, that's really frustrating. And, and actually just reminded me of one other pain point is because of our, our accessibility to Asia um, and historically our lack of in, um, government support and investment, I think, in technology, which has done a massive turnaround, um, a lot of great talent goes overseas, mm. whether it be to study or to have their first jobs or second jobs. The market is 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 bigger and broader for them, um, you know, in the US or the UK or wherever that may be. And we send a lot of our kind of dev work and kind of those entry level roles. We just send a, a lot of that overseas or to third parties and outsource a lot of that. And so what happens is we lose this fantastic talent. They go on to you know, found a company or become a chief product manager in an organisation in San Fran and we'll never get them back. And I think as an industry, um, we need to support and make sure that we're, we're putting those entry-level jobs here in Australia where we need them. Mm. I've, I've spoken yesterday actually to one of the um, well-known startups um, and their issue currently was, well, partially market, but it was because of government and, and what's currently happening in terms of pandemic and that sort of stuff, they mm. could not grow in this market. So they had to go to US because it's a better, it's a bigger uh, market and then it's kind of more lively and uh, business is more flowing there. Um, mm. And they had to actually go there because they were dying. As a so company. they actually shifted? Are you saying they shifted? They didn't just enter the market they actually moved their business to the market well they that's kind such of a moved. shame yeah so that they, they kind of had because yeah. they weren't making any sales or maybe not enough here so they had to really go so what do you think it's uh what are we doing ours? wrong mm, it, <laughs> what are yeah. we doing wrong that's yeah. that's a real shame it's really disappointing like you know mathematically we know that the u.s is a big market um but you know per capita i think we're really great early adopters of technology and um, it's a very um, consumer-led um, market here. And a lot of organisations do a lot of their test and learning here. So some of the international organisations I've worked for have actually launched products here to test how they would be received in a US or UK market. Mm. Um, so it's disappointing to hear that someone didn't have enough, you know, of a return on investment to stay in this market and expand overseas. And that's a great example of what I was talking about. We're losing talent to these other markets. Mm, mm. it's great to hear the stories when some of those ta talents and, and companies return or reopen the offices but it's definitely sad to see them go because we don't know when 
they will come back. And usually they come back in a 10 or 20 years after they really kind of had enough of other markets, they kind of come back for a more lifestyle uh, mm. back to Australia, but they, they really go out because of the business opportunities and, 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 you know, that's something that we can uh, work on and be better at here, uh, trying to create um, opportunities for, for companies. Yeah, especially keeping their head office here. So keeping yeah. their head office and their developers and their project managers here. So there's something in that, um, yeah. well, you know, regardless of market size and opportunity, yeah. you know, what could we be doing at a government level to make sure that we're making it attractive for those types of organisations to continue to be headquartered here and to continue to grow here as well as overseas. Yeah, that's a smart thing because we want all that world cash to come back into Australia. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. Uh, talking about cash, I cannot uh, be more excited to ask you the following question. Let's talk about Afterpay. Let's talk yeah. about this amazing news that hit um us i think this week uh, yes they started 2015 they were also um pause awards uh, winners uh last were they year. i didn't yeah. know that that's for, wonderful yeah for scaling globally the the award called um out of garage uh, which is amazing that totally um did that and and, and more 39 billion after getting married to square what's your thoughts about being in, in the fintech industry yeah, I'm absolutely thrilled um, for Nick and Anthony and the team at Afterpay. It's been such an exciting journey to watch. And to be honest, even being in the fintech industry, the Square and Afterpay relationship absolutely took me by surprise. I did not see that coming at all. Um, but then upon reflection, it makes perfect sense because you've got two very customer-centric organisations that have totally revolutionised an industry by creating something new and relevant that is inclusive uh, and democratises a part of the industry, which is really exciting. And I can absolutely see, you know, as we look at that omni-channel from e-commerce right through to in-store, you can see these companies bridging that gap and bringing that all together as one for the consumer. I think from a fintech industry perspective and even in the startup community, it's great to see an Australian startup in such a short period of time hit evaluation like that and then also be in a relationship like that. It gives me a lot of hope for our market. It's definitely put us on the global stage. Um, and so it's exciting. I think that there'd be a lot of founders in Australia and people working in startups that would be really excited and it would give them a lot more momentum and fuel to what they're working on, that's for sure. And inspired that to see that you know because this momentum and it just kind of happened in such a short period of time i was i was shocked i was like mm. what um yeah is this happening square yes. right <laughs> uh, well they just rebranded and did some other amazing stuff and now this it's kind of it, they're just kind of really surprising all the time every every half a year there was a some uh, announcement oh, that again yeah. you know took took you by surprise but also made perfect sense mm. um and completely changed the market. So, you know, good on them. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, definitely great for us here to think that we can build something from here, dream big and and get there amongst the biggest brands uh, in Silicon Valley and mm. partner with them and being bought by them. Exactly. Um, you are a well-recognized female leader um, and I wanted to ask you a bit about your advocacy because mm -hmm. I know you you're doing a lot for the community, um, mm -hmm. and I also want to see if 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 that's an intentional because you you do have potentially uh, an idea or plan or what that potentially a legacy might be of yours. Uh, I wanted to ask you, yeah, a little bit about that. What is it mm -hmm. that you do in a mm -hmm. community? Because I know you're very active. Yeah. So. Um... I have been really fortunate in my career to have some really terrible leaders and some really amazing leaders, um, some very passionate mentors um, who were very supportive of me. And what I learned from those experiences is how 
much impact a great leader can have and, you know, conversely, a terrible leader can have on productivity, on creativity, uh, on momentum and on an organisation and an individual in particular. And, you know, I think I'm sure there are people that can relate to being in roles where, you know, there could have been times in their career where they felt like they couldn't speak up in a room and couldn't share their ideas and be creative. And at the end of the day, we're in the tech industry. (laughs) There is no room for that. And I love mentoring and being an advocate um, for the startup community and being available to you know young founders and people working in those types of companies because I want them to have somebody that they can talk to I'm happy to share my experience I'm happy to mentor them and potentially be giving them support where they may not be getting it themselves in their current roles Uh, and I think if everybody as they moved through their career did that they'd be helping someone else and and I think it's what I want to make really clear as well is I get as much if not more out of doing that than I'm sure they do from me. It's like having, you know, eyes and ears everywhere um, as they're sharing their experiences with me. I'm learning as they're sharing, you know, complex um, ideas that they want to sush out with me and bounce off me before, you know, sharing them at work or, you know, as, as a sounding box. I'm learning all the time. And so, you know, it's just as much they're giving to me as, as I'm giving as I'm giving back to them. Mm. You still mentoring with Startmate? Yes, yes. I haven't. I didn't join the last cohort. I was a little bit too um, busy. When I do it, I really like to get heavily involved. So the the first time I did it, uh, I did the program. I was on, I think, four squads and doing a bunch of it. I didn't realize, um, you know, how much work was involved, but I loved every second of it, and I got to know the companies I worked with really closely, and we've all stayed in contact. So when I do go again, and I'm hoping to do that early next year, then I know I can throw myself back into it. Yeah, I can see you're definitely love to hear and see new ideas and talk about talk to entrepreneurs about them. Um, well, here at Pause uh, Awards, you get to get a, another exposure to some amazing startups. What are you uh, excited about to see? Yes, I am so excited. I mean, the, the answer I guess you're looking from me for would be around the fintech and financial services space. But, you know, that, that is exciting to me. I love that stuff. And with the launch of open banking and where we're headed in the market with Pay2, I'm really excited to see if there's any fintechs. Um, but fintechs aside, what I'm really excited about is tech companies that are creating really amazing consumer experiences. Um, Consumer-centric tech startups um, really excite me, um, particularly those that are, like I said, it make, in making something accessible that wasn't before. So I'm really pumped to see who comes through this year. Mm. Um, us too, definitely uh, want to see how those uh, amazing companies and founders commercialize the, those ideas and, and, and build mm-hmm. the products that, that serve the consumers well. And finally, I just wanted to ask you about um, a personal passion of yours, and Mm. that's uh, Gourmet Adventures. Can you tell us a little (laughs) bit about that? That's a really (laughs) eloquent way of saying I like to eat food and drink wine. (laughs) That's basically what that is, which is also why I have to work out uh, because of all the wine and the food. Um, No, I'm a big foodie. Yeah. Um, and, and I love wine. So in my time off, they're things that I really enjoy doing. And when I travel and make decisions about where I'm going to go on a holiday, those are really high on my agenda. Um, and recently, the last trip I went on was um, down to the Barossa with a group of friends. And we, we had a fabulous time going from winery to winery. And, and each night we'd chosen, you know, an amazing restaurant to eat at. And so, yeah, that's definitely something I enjoy. That's great. I need to explore more Barossa. I only went there about a few months ago when there was uh, there was a, a South Star Tech Festival there, and they took us wow. out for excursion. It was amazing. But yeah, that's great. That's that's a good good uh, addiction mm. to have. Yeah, and I love um, experiences where the food's involved. So yeah. I haven't done this, but um, someone I know did this recently. There's a place in the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria that's a truffle farm. And so you can go and actually help collect the truffles mm. and then have dinner and eat the truffles and then kind of stay on the truffle farm. So that's like a full experience. And 
Um, one of the next things I want to do is go to the Bay of Fires in Tasmania. Um, as I also enjoy hiking, so being able to hike while enjoying cool climate wines and a foot spa is, um, yeah, it's definitely my cup of tea. Okay, well, next time I chat to you, let's do the whole session about um, <laughs> uh, gourmet adventures, hiking and um, good wine and places to go. Done. Amazing. Thank you for uh, spending some time with us and thank you for being the Posable's judge. It was a pleasure talking to you and uh, I look forward to chatting to you later on when we go through the uh, entries. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, George. Cheers.